we started a two-part lesson last week. This is the second part on spiritual formation. Say that with me, spiritual formation. Well, we begin to ask the questions, what does it mean to grow as a person? What does spiritual formation look like? What does it mean to grow personally, intellectually, physically, and spiritually? What does it mean to grow in every area of our life, even at midlife? How do we stretch ourselves so that we can grow? And one of the things, there were several things that came out of that lesson, and I put them all on the handout tonight. That we talked about the fact that we don't just grow automatically. It has to be intentional. Although most, most of our growth is sporadic, that we tend to grow in spurts and then we stall. We grow, and then we stall. But one of the scriptures we looked at was Luke chapter 2, verse 42, where it says about Jesus that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. It was physical, it was social, it was emotional, it was mental, and it was spiritual growth. In all areas, he was progressing and moving forward. And then you remember in the in the conversations around the table one of the questions we struggled with is do you have a written plan for your personal growth in the next 12 months go on look at your neighbor again say have you got it now okay amen or do you plan to leave it to chance are you going to be intentional about the areas of your growth? Or are you going to leave it to chance? Have you set some goals in the different areas of life and then develop some action steps to help get you there? Because we made several observations about growth, um, and they are listed on your handout tonight. Observation number one is that growth is a sign of life. We also pointed out that growth requires effort, that growth should be pursued primarily in the area of our giftedness. Look at your neighbor and say, do you know what your gift is? Yeah, that ought to be a fundamental question that all of us ought to think about, pray about, meditate about, because your weaknesses will only get so much stronger. It is your gift that is going to drive you to be a winner in life and to be a success. So growth should be pursued in the area of our giftedness. And growth is essential for health. It's essential for other people because the people around you are going to be impacted by whether you grow or not. If you're stalled, they're going to be stalled. Now, the old people used to say it like this, birds of a feather uh-huh amen see so if you if you think you are an eagle and you are surrounded by chickens something is wrong okay somebody is out of place because at, at your growth how you grow spiritually intellectually emotionally it's going to change your associations either they will rise up to go with you or they will be relationships that you'll reframe for the next phase of your life. And then number six, your growth should be noticed by others. And I didn't point out last week that that's going to be both positive and negative because there are some people who are going to see you grow and they will not like it. They will not like the new you. They are not going to like the person who is emerging. And you've got to have courage enough to be able to deal with that and face that uh, because your destiny is at stake. And then observation number seven, we pointed out that growth requires a process, not just an event. So it's not a one-time occurrence. I grew today and it's over. No, it's a process. And so I'd like to take the remaining 
teaching moments I have in this lesson to try to do something that I think is pretty audacious. I want to walk you through your entire life from birth to burial, from womb to tomb, from the cradle to the crib, to the day when you are old, gray, and wrinkled, and you look back and assess how you have lived. And if you have done it well in partnership and collaboration with God, you will be at that moment a person of influence, not just in time, but for all eternity. Now, incidentally, I should tell you that this is a divine goal for every single one of us. And let me state it plainly, that God wants to develop us into people of influence who contribute to the whole world through their gifts. So let me try and walk you through your life. And to do it, of course, I want to tell you another story. It's a story about a little boy who just loved parades. In fact, on the 4th of July, he ran out into his backyard because he had heard that a parade was passing right by his yard. Unfortunately, his yard had a six-foot-tall privacy fence all around it, so he quickly ran over to a little hole in one of the planks of the fence. He pressed his eye up against it, and he he could only see what was directly in front of the hole. So when the band went by, it was exciting. When the clowns went by, it was funny. When the floats went by, it was exhilarating. His dad, looking out the window, saw the little boy struggling to see the parade through that hole. So he came out, grabbed the little boy by the waist, hoisted him up on his shoulders, and his dad was six feet two, six feet three, hoisted him up on his shoulders. And for the first time, the little boy could see the whole parade. For the first time, he understood what a parade really looked like. Not the risk of sounding a little cocky. I want to hoist you up tonight on the shoulders of faith and help you to see your entire life in one fell swoop. With one broad brush stroke. I want to walk you through these stages and help you to see what I believe God wants us to see through the scripture and what God wants to do and build in us as he builds us in the people of influence with our cooperation. Because if we fully cooperate with God in our growth, these are the six stages that we would expect experience in this order and life stage number one and I'm not talking about the dream chasers right now okay but life stage number one and I'm gonna use that phrase tonight is what I call providential beginnings this is the stage that transpires between our first awareness of our need for God and our spiritual birth into the family of God. Now, usually in this early stage, we are not cooperating with God at all. And God functions in our lives in a totally providential way. I love that word providential. Providence comes from the blending of two words, pro and video, which means, get this, God sees ahead of time. And because God sees ahead of time what's coming, God begins to position you and shape you exactly as he wants to so that he can use you and your story for his honor and for his glory. And there are two pieces of good news here. Number one, God does pretty much all the work at this first stage because you are not even at the point in this stage where you are cooperating with God. You may be aware of God, but you're really not trying to do the will of God in any serious way. And like a good father who is raising a toddler and parenting well, even when the toddler doesn't reciprocate anything at all, God is raising us up at this point, moving us 
us spiritually, working on our story, working on our ethics, building sensitivity into our conscience about right and wrong, working on our character, our personality, our preferences, the flavors that we savor, all of those things that make us terribly unique. God is forming in this early stage. This is foundational for our growth. And I love that word too, foundation. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but it, is there anybody in the room tonight who periodically likes to drive through new subdivisions and look them over? Anybody like that? Okay, because one of the reasons I like that is you get to see how the floor plan is laid out, how they did this, and how they're going to do that. But have you ever driven through a new subdivision when they were just getting started? Because when nothing on the house was finished, it was just a lot of wood and concrete and pipes jutting out everywhere, rough wiring, no windows or doors. Can I ask you a question? If you've ever done the both of those, in which house did you spend the most time? The one that was finished and ready to be sold or the one that was rough with not a lot going on? the one that was finished. I can almost guarantee it was not the one that was just roughed in. I mean, if you've seen one slab, you've seen them all. It, it's just the foundation. And you can't really tell much about what that house is going to be by looking at the foundation. But would you not agree with me tonight that the foundation is the most essential part of that house because the foundation determines what is possible there. It's not sexy, it's kind of boring, but it's fundamental. Know it or not, like it or not, cooperate or not, in this early stage, what God is doing when we first come to God in faith, when God first begins to operate in our lives from our earliest beginning, even as children, what God is doing is forming the foundation for our entire lives. And can I give you some good news for those of you in this room tonight who are thinking, well, preacher, I done already messed that up. My early life was horrible. I, I did all kind of stuff. This is what I want you to know, that God uses both the good and the bad for his glory. It's providential blessing. Psalm 139 talks about how God shapes us in our early years into the person he wants us to become. So the first stage of our spiritual formation is providential beginnings. The second stage is character formation. Now this optimally starts at the point where you actually decide to become a Christian. That is the decision to cooperate with God. That is the decision to say yes to Christ. And at this stage, you begin to have an interest in the scriptures. One of the ways that you know that you have made an authentic authentic confession of faith is you become interested in God and interested in the church and interested in the word of God. There's no such thing in the scripture as a Christian who is unattached from the fellowship. So all these people now, and I know it's popular to say, and I'm probably going to upset some of y'all by saying it, who say, I like Jesus, but I ain't into the church. They are not biblical Christians. Amen. According to the text, they are not really Christians because that would be like saying, I like to, I like music and, and I like to be a musician, but I ain't interested in playing an instrument. Or I, I, I'm, a, I'm into football, but I ain't going to no games. Okay, and I ain't going to play the game. I want to play baseball, but I don't want to be on the field with the second baseman. 
No, see, it don't work that way. See, it's a team effort. It's about the community. And at this stage, you begin to have an interest in the scriptures. You want to pray, even if you don't know how to pray. You come to worship, even if you don't fully understand what's going on in worship. You want to know what this is all about. And it's not long before you begin to discover that God insists on building you from the inside out and not the outside in. Look at somebody near you and say it's inside out. See, because the temptation at stage two is to try to do it from the outside in. And that's what gets a lot of people stuck, that they start focusing on how I look from the outside in. So I try to look religious and sound religious and say churchy kind of stuff. Oh, that's outside in because you can do all of that. You can project a great image and still be just rotten in the core. See, that's the culture's influence. That's not the influence of Jesus Christ. Our culture is hugely image conscious, so focused on what is seen, on how things seem to be. How do I smell? How do I look? How do I sound? That's all outside in. But God wants us, friends, to understand that his work in our lives, particularly at this second stage, which is about character formation, is inside out. It's about your personal, private, inward disciplines. And I want to encourage you not to look for a shortcut, but to put in the work. Because I have a confession for you. I've, I've been a Christian. I made the decision to follow Christ at 12 years old. I got called to preach at 12 years old. I started preaching at 12 years old. Now, but this is what I want you to understand. The disciplines that guide my life now at this stage of my life were developed when I was a teenager. Yeah, okay, y'all missed it. Okay. I still pray every day. I started that as a teenager. I still read the scriptures every day. I started that as a teen. Not just because I have to preach. I read it so that I can eat. Do you understand? Okay. Because preaching is like being a cook. You know, you serving other people. You, you preparing a meal for them. But it's a poor chef who don't sample his own food. Okay, see, I still confess my sin every day. I still try to practice humility. I still tithe. I still share my testimony with those who do not yet have a relationship with God. All of those are habits and attitudes for which there is no shortcut. You can talk about it, but until you do it, it doesn't mean anything. I don't have it all together either because while I have those habits and some of them are very well developed, I did not as a teenager develop the habit of regular physical exercise. Okay, I, I know y'all want me to sound deep. I did not develop the habit as a teenager of being disciplined about what I eat. And so as a result, as a grown man, I still struggle with the exercise and with the eating. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm talking about me. I ain't talking about you, so you ain't got to be uncomfortable. See, but the work of God at this stage, at this second stage, is inside out. When God is forming your character, God deals with issues like identity. Where, where here you acknowledge that you are uniquely wired and you come to understand that you don't have to be anybody else. You don't have to imitate anybody else. You acknowledge your strengths and your weaknesses. That I have a light and I understand that the brighter the light, the longer the shadow. Oh, this is going right over your head. Amen. See, that you can't have a bright light and not have a shadow. 
And what trips most of us up is not our light. It's the shadow. See, God begins at this stage to instill discipline in you so that you do things in private when nobody is watching, when nobody is cheering, when nobody is applauding. You settle the lordship issue. Who is going to lead my life? You enter the dance floor with God with the understanding that God is leading and not you. You begin to become more intimate with God, not just knowing about God, but knowing God in a relationship. God pushes you towards emotional security so that your feelings stop overwhelming your faith. The reason this is so critical is that we all know, even if we don't admit it, people who have bypassed stage two. They have skipped character formation. Why? Because they had a huge gift or an incredible talent. And now they're public people. And although they are very smart, very intelligent, very gifted, they will do something very dumb. We all know people like that. You know, I'm t because every week in America, there's some story like that. And I don't need to recant any of them because you already know them. They skip stage two. They didn't allow God to work on their character from the inside out. And stage two is critical because this is where you get your ethics. Everybody know this word, ethics? ethics, like your laws, your rules of behavior, how you going to behave no matter what's going on. See, at this stage, you settle it that I'm not a person who lies. I'm, I'm not a person who steals. I'm, I'm not a person... See, see, that's ethical behavior, that, that I know how to function. I, I'm a loyal person. I keep my word. I have integrity. I say what I mean and mean what I say. You, I can be relied on. I can be dependent on. All of those things I'm talking about there are character issues. And they happen from the inside out. See, it's critical because nobody is applauding you at this stage because it's happening not on the outside, but it's happening on the inside. I love the story of the millionaire who hired this builder. Did I tell you all this? Who gave him specs for a house that he wanted built. And then he gave him this huge sum of money to build it. He said, I just want you to build what I gave you. And before the meeting concluded, the millionaire said, now you probably won't need all the money I gave you. He said, but what, whatever money you have left when you finish, you can keep it. Okay, so what did the builder do? It depends. It depends on his character, right? Because the builder in this story immediately saw money signs. He went out, he started building, he was taking shortcuts everywhere. Instead of putting the studs eight feet apart, he put them 15 feet apart with one nail per board. He put one coat of paint on the walls with no primer. He finished that house in four weeks when it was supposed to take four months. He came back with pockets full of money. He gave the keys to the millionaire and said, I'm done with your house. And the millionaire gave the keys back to him and said, oh, I'm I forgot to tell you, the house is yours. <laughs> oh, y'all got to get that, see. I wonder whether sometimes God is saying to us, you do know that this is your life you build it. You do understand that the shortcuts you take are going to haunt you more than they're going to haunt me. Because how often do we fall into that trap? God wants to build you in private before he blesses you in public. That's a great tweet. Uh, I, I, I'm going to tweet that. Amen. That, don't y'all do it. Amen. Just, just retweet me when you see it out there. Okay. But look, God wants to develop your being before you start doing. Because if you get the being down, the doing will take care of itself. I, I got another confession. Even in the middle of my life, I am working right now on this stage because some of the disciplines I should have developed a long time ago, I did not. Now, I'm not asking you to be that honest tonight, but I am asking you to be 
be honest with yourself and honest with God. Don't let your pursuit of progress short circuit your mastery of the process. Let me rush on. Number three, once you move, once you grow, so you start off in providential beginnings. That's the first stage of spiritual formation. Then God moves you into forming your character. That's Galatians 4.19 where Paul says, he says, I can't be satisfied until Christ be formed in you. That's, that's character formation. But then stage number three, and listen closely, is what I call service and application. Now, something really different happens at this stage of your spiritual development. Listen close. Stage one is about birth until you decide to follow Christ. Stage two is from the moment of your deciding to follow Christ through your spiritual adolescence until you hit stage three, where now the primary way in which you are going to learn and grow spiritually is by applying the knowledge that you now have. That is powerful. This is critical because what I hope you walk away with here is that my life is supposed to change. Your life is, I, you were not created to stay the same. Nothing stays the same. This third stage is the stage wherein the only way you're going to grow is you got to do something. In fact, at the third stage, just coming to Bible study and absorbing what is said will become boring to you. Because you've got, in order for you to keep growing, you have to now shift to doing what you already know. And, and what is it, it, it's bombshell, listening to sermons are going to be boring to you if you don't make this shift. Moving into this third stage, the songs won't resonate with you anymore. Because this third stage, you've got to do what you believe and not just say what you believe okay let, let me show you where it is in the bible in hebrews 5 11 i didn't put it on the outline but if you start in 5 11 and read the hebrews 6 3 the writer describes this stage listen to the words that he says he says we have much to say and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you still need somebody to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. What is he describing? He's describing a person who is 57 years old and still want to eat baby food. Did y'all get that? Still looking for the pacifier and the bottle. And you do realize that part of the major problem in this church and every other church is that they are filled with people who won't get off the pacifier. And they come every week and say, stick that pacifier in my mouth, Pastor. Don't tell me to do nothing. I see that fork right there, but it feel better if you feed me. No, spiritually, my friends, the goal, the goal that I'm after is to get you to be a self-feeder. Where no matter where you go, you're spiritually growing. You are spiritually developing. See, because just to hear, and that's why this stage is so important. He said, for everyone who partakes only of milk are unskilled in the word of righteousness and they are babes. Verse 14, but solid food belongs to those who are full age. That is, and he explains what it is. Those who by reason of use, everybody say use. Come on, say it out loud, use. 
have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And by perfection, he doesn't mean being perfect. The word is actually translated better, maturity. Let us go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. He's talking about two types of people here, babies and the mature. The two groups eat two different types of food. Babies eat milk, the mature eat solid food. And contrary to what most of us believe about the passage, solid food, when you're talking spiritually, is not just deeper teaching. You know, because what happens is when we, when we hesitate to move on the doing after we have learned, then we start looking for the thrill. You know, so we, we, we become a, a, a conference junkie. Where, where I, you know, I go to a, this conference and that conference and I start looking for this person and that person to do this thing and that thing. And the thing that really needs to be done is in you. See, that's what most of us think. But meat or solid food here is more than mental or emotional stimulation. You've probably heard people say, I'm just not getting fed. I want to go where they preach the meat of the word of God. Now, that sounds noble, but often what people mean is that they just want more mental or emotional stimulation. They're not going to do anything with it. They just want to be stimulated. It's like a junkie. I need a fix. Oh, I can't tell you, boy. You know, you hang out somewhere 30 years, you learn a lot about people. And I can't tell you the number of people, God bless them, may he take care of them, who have been a part of St. Paul's, who left St. Paul's, because I realize that people cannot grow if they are constantly emotionally stimulated. E.L. Fleming is dead and gone. He pastored six Baptist church for over 40 years. He invited me as a young preacher. I, I mean, I've been here two years to preach revival at Morning Star Baptist Church, his other church way in the country. And my car wasn't that good. That, that tells you a whole lot right there, okay? My car wasn't that good. And so he came to my house and picked me up from our apartment every night and drove me 45 miles to preach revival. And on the last night, I never will forget, this has been years ago, 20, 25 years ago, I never will forget what that old man said to me. He said, you know, you're some kind of preacher. Oh, that felt good right there. He said, every night I watch you. He said, and when you get finished, you done flipped them on their head. And uh, I, I said, God bless you, Doc, you know, trying to be deferential. And he said, but before you get out the car, he said, this is what I want you to think about. When you flip them on their head, what part of them are you talking to? He said, periodically, you need to sit people on their behind. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm too raw. Yeah, I promise I'll keep it a hundred, amen. He says, sit them on their behind and talk to their mind. Amen. Because see, a lot of people, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything against authentic praise, but I'm saying that if you are not careful, we'll substitute the hollering and the running and the jumping and the shouting for the growing and the doing and the serving and the loving that we are called to in Jesus Christ. Okay, see, and, and that's the seduction. The seduction is to substitute a CD, DVD series for conduct, to know everything about stewardship, but give God no money and no minutes, to know everything about evangelism, but never talk to anybody about God, to understand all the intricacies of worship, but we never actually worship when we show up. See, the transition at this stage is from passive receiving to active doing. And I got a feeling this room is full of people 
who are somewhere in this stage. We are in an age of information, and so often we think that once I got the information, I done passed the test. But that is not how God grades the exam. In stage three, the primary way you're going to learn and grow is not just by getting more information about God, about faith, about love, but by actually doing something with the information that you get. If you don't make this transition, my friends, you're going to stunt your spiritual growth. And the issue will not be the church, not be the pastor, the diaconate, or anybody else. It'll be you because you're trying to do at this stage what work in the last stage but you are not in that stage no more how many of you have already in your spiritual life had the experience of praying just like you always prayed but now it don't work like it did you know back back in the beginning you was like walk a miracle for me and God worked a miracle. Make a way for me. And God made a way. And then you got to the next step. Make a way for me. Did you hear me? <laughs> See, they, they will pray, touch and agree with me. Let's pray my make a way for me prayer. You know, see, but it's because you have moved on to a different stage. And what, is there anybody here who has ever potty trained a child? Y'all potty trained a child. There comes a point in potty training where effectiveness, growth, learning, and development is not measured by a child's ability to identify the potty. That's the potty. <laughs> or point to the bathroom. Or say potty. Say potty. No, there comes a point where that child on their own initiative has to recognize what is happening inside of them. Stop whatever they're doing, go to the restroom and do what they have been trained to do. Am I making sense to anybody? See, all of us need to hear this message at this stage because when you fail to do what you've been trained to do, like a parent, God holds you accountable for the application of the information. And when a child consistently does not do what you have patiently trained them to do, what's going to happen? There's going to be some discipline. And I can't tell you how many times God has spiritually spanked me to get me to a place where I would do what I knew. I, I got the feeling I ain't the only one who never got a divine whooping. See, whenever you see that word meat used in this context, especially in the New Testament, know that it refers to doing what you know. In John 4.34, Jesus says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. He wasn't talking about deeper teaching, but active doing. So stage three, God says to you and me, I love you, but if you're going to continue to grow, I need you to do what you know. Keep learning, but do what you know. Stop making excuses and do what you know. Oh, oh this reminds me of Sunday. Do the move. Okay. If you wasn't here, you all know, you all know, okay, get out of the nest and fly. You're going to be terrified at first, but it's going to be an incredible adventure. Because in this phase, you know what God is trying to do? He's trying to get you to settle the issue of submission to break that wild stallion inside of you so that you can use productively the power that he's put within you, learn teamwork and cooperation. A second issue he's addressed beyond submission because you do know, well, maybe you don't. So let me just tell you, you are an extremely powerful being. There's power in your words, power in your action, power in your activities, power in your ideas. You are, and, and look, the thing that distinguishes a wild stallion from a thoroughbred is that the thoroughbred has had its will shaped. That's the point of the harness. The point of the harness is to tame that wild power and make it useful. You got to get that. He's still powerful. 
It's just over here, he couldn't use it. He didn't even know what the power was for. So he used it for all the wrong things. The other issue God is getting at here is purpose, where you begin to find your niche. A third issue is responsibility, where you are no longer just clocking in. You feel responsible. So if there are no deacons to walk the new members back, you get out the aisle. You grab one, and you walk them on down. If there's nobody to pray for somebody on your row who need prayer, you've been here praying for five years years and God been blessing you you've been in Bible study for seven and a half years you ought to be able to reach over and say let me pray for you right here right now and believe God for their deliverance at this stage you also learn sacrifice you learn how to give up what's due you and owed you for something bigger than you you learn people skills because at this stage God wants to increase your emotional intelligence where you gain a sense of how you're coming across to others, of how your words and your body language and your actions are affecting other people. Now, I know people in their 40s and in their 50s and in their 60s who have no people skills. And that's why they're not growing. Because part of God's formation in our lives is to teach us how to deal with other people. Now, having said that, let me say this. Everybody you meet is not your assignment. You should write that on your paper tonight. That's going to deliver you. See, and you do yourself a favor by learning to identify quickly people who you cannot help. Because when you keep trying to help them and you can't help them because they're not your assignment, you are standing in the way of God providing the help that they need. Sometimes you got to come loose. Hard as that is to say, amen. You got to cut them loose. You got to cut them loose. You got, oh, I'm enjoying this. You got to cut them loose. I've had to cut people loose. Amen. Once I realize that they're not my assignment, I'm okay with that because they don't belong to me. They belong to God. Amen. They belong to God. See, and God at this stage begins to shape our people skills physically uh, and mentally and spiritually and emotionally. God is growing us in every phase of our lives. To go back to my house metaphor, stage one is the foundation. Stage two is the framework. Stage three are the fixtures, the electricity, the heat and the cooling, the plumbing, all the stuff that make the house work, all the stuff behind the switch in the wall and the faucet in the sink. It's all the stuff that makes the house livable. That's stage three. So stage four is momentum and production. Now, this generally happens in midlife. Here, for the first time, God actually expects results out of you. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God expects results. See, up until this point, you've been a student. God has been grooming you. Think about it for a moment. The first 30 years of Jesus' 33-year life were all preparation. That's why you don't hear nothing from him in the scriptures. You see him one time when he's 12 at his bar mitzvah. He's in the temple. And what is he doing in the temple? He's got the scriptures. He's a student. He's in preparation. See, in this stage, your being and your doing come together. And when your being and your doing come together, you begin to see fruit come out in various ways in your life. Here you become admired by others and you gain momentum. Back to the house analogy, stage four is all the stuff you can see. You're now visible and very open to the public eye and people admire what they see. They don't know your story, but they admire your glory. They don't know your grind, but they're impressed by your shine. Okay, that and and you in this stage, you enjoy living in the will of God and submitting to God and serving God instead of grieve it if you have done this right. How many of you have ever heard of midlife crisis? 
Okay, I believe that midlife crisis may be normal, but it's not necessary. A crisis happens at midlife to men and women who get there and then look back and realize that they have not become who they wanted to be. They have not done the things that they wanted to do. They have not built the legacy that they wanted to leave. And grieving over those things, they began to make external changes to try to address the problem. So the middle-aged man get rid of his middle-aged woman. Do I have to go all the way down this street? Buy a little red Corvette. Okay, because he, he, we change spouses and jobs and cars, but you can never solve an internal problem with an external solution. God's intention for us at midlife is to be able to look in the mirror and like the person that you ha can see. Can I give you a quick snapshot in Genesis? The story of Joseph is told starting at Genesis 37. Joseph went through a grueling 23 year process moving through stages two and three. But the process prepared him for promotion. He was elevated and then he led Egypt through hard times. Why? Because he had been through hard times himself and he knew what to do in hard times. Are y'all getting this? Think about Moses. The first 40 years of his life, he spent as a somebody. The next 40 years of his life, he spent as a nobody. And the last 40 years of his life, he spent as a nobody willing to tell everybody about somebody who can save, use, and bless anybody. Okay, so God at this stage, at stage four, expects results out of us and our fruit becomes evident for people to see. At stage five, can I give you some big words now? Just ask your neighbor how to spell them if you don't know. Or if you don't, if they don't know either, say we both need Google in our lives, okay? Uh, uh, because this stage is convergence and significance. If you have lived through stages one through four faithfully, stage five is where everything converges, break it down, comes together. Okay, all the parts of your life. There is a convergence of who you are as a person, what you do as a task, and where you are as a context. Y'all gotta get that. It's very intentional. Person, task, and context come together and you get the blessing of living in a sweet spot. Tap your neighbor and say, that's where I'm trying to get to. You're not just bearing fruit here, but you're flourishing. Your fruit is bearing fruit. Y'all don't hear it. People look at you and you'll feel uncomfortable because you look better than you know you really are. In your mind now, because your character has been formed, because you submitted to the will of God, you are just doing what you're supposed to do. But people will admire you, they'll laud you, they'll applaud you. But get this, it won't change you. Because at this phase, you are so grounded and rooted and planted. Your course is set. Your gate is fixed. Your target is tandem out. You have really made the internal decision that it is all about God. And that is no longer a slogan for you. It's not something you just flippantly say. It is the bedrock upon which your entire life is constructed. This stage is what I want to call life unbelievable where you wake up in the morning and you know I was built for this I can't believe I get to live like this go and tell your neighbor say that's where I'm trying to get to see because your person and your task and your context have all come together the deep satisfaction of stage five comes from making decisions really well when you see people who have matured to this level, people often call them wise because they make really good decisions. And you do realize that your life is the sum total of your decisions. That if you make bad decisions, you can't have a good life. 
Oh, you ought to tap your neighbor and say, that's worthy to write down, friend. Okay, at the turn of the century, at the turn of the 20th century, there were two boys growing up in the same neighborhood. And as adults, both of them contracted polio. The first one responded naturally. When polio afflicted him, he thought, that's it. My dreams will never be realized. My life is over. But the second boy decided, I'm going to work through this. I'm going to pursue my goals despite the challenges of polio. I'm going to use this affliction to my advantage. And the second boy became president of the United States. His name was Franklin Roosevelt. Same situation, but two different responses. Here's number six. I call it afterglow and anointing. In this stage, you are generally in your twilight years. You have gray hair or no hair. But it really doesn't matter. You're looking back on your life and you are enjoying what you have built with God along the way. Can I, can I give you the text? Proverbs 16, 31 says, gray hair, gray hair, gray hair. You got to look up to see what I'm doing. Gray hair is like a crown of splendor. My whole head ain't gray. I just got a little bit. That means I'm headed in the right direction, okay? Gray hair is like a crown of splendor attained by a righteous life. Stage six, you live at this stage like you have a crown on your head. I'm not talking about riches or fame or notoriety, but you are highly influential at this stage. People are asking you to mentor them and to counsel them because they love the life they see in you and they want you to rub off on them. People want to end up like you did. Let me give you one picture of this. He's not perfect, but he is an example. Billy Graham started his ministry in the 1940s and throughout his life, he has managed to live a life of integrity. He's watched his words. He's tried to conduct himself in a Christian way. And now he is living his life at stage six. People don't hear Billy Graham now because he's fiery. All the fire gone. They don't go to hear him when he speaks because he's deep or philosophical. His presentation at the end of his life was relatively simple. They went to hear him because of who he was. Who he was outshined who he, what he said. And that, my friends, will happen to you. Quick footnote, you're going to notice as you listen to these stages that you'll begin to feel, if you're honest and sane, that you have not done some stuff well. Look at your neighbor and say, welcome to the human race. Because here's the grace that I discovered. Now that I know what should have happened and didn't, or what did happen but shouldn't have, I've been able to go back to earlier stages and work on the issues I miss. And I want to encourage you to do that tonight. I want to encourage you to intentionally collaborate with God on your spiritual development. Don't stop growing. And remember, you have to do your own growing. You've got to do your own growing. Because no matter how tall your daddy was or how fit your mama was, you got to do it for yourself. So having shared those stages, I want you to talk about it. Take your neighbor by the hand. And let's pray. And before I pray, I want you to pray. For the neighbor whose hand you hold. Just close your eyes, bow your head. And pray for that person. That the Lord would bless them, that he keep them. That he help them to grow where they need to grow. And God, that's our prayer tonight. We pray first for our neighbors that you would help them to grow where they need to grow. Thank you for your word that is a lamp to our feet and a light on our pathway. We thank you that your word is clear and it's concise and it's pointed and that you do not give up on us, but you always meet us where we are so you can take us where we need to be. So now, God, in faith and in hope, I pray for my neighbor that you would move them the next step of the journey. And while you're passing out blessings, do not pass me by. But bless me so that I can take my next step 
in Jesus' name, amen.